Alanis Obamsawin joins me now in Studio Q. Hello, pleasure to meet you. Thank you. And I want to just for a moment go back to the beginning of the story. As a starting point, and generally, what did this treaty say? Well, the treaty says that uh, in uh, it's written on paper that uh, people give up their land and there's, there's, the government becomes, in other words, the people who can make regulations and say you cannot uh, hunt or fish this time. You know, all, this, all their rights to the land. In, on paper, it says that uh, they surrender all their land, all their rights in perpetuity forever to the king mm. and its uh, descendants. And that's not what they were told. And of course, you know, those people could not speak English. And so it was ex supposedly explain what was written on the, uh, the actual document, but that's not what they were told at all. They said things to get them to sign. And it was uh, the king, you are the, the children of the king, and he's uh, forever compassionate towards his children. And the, the king is giving you a present this year. It's going to be $8 for each head. Next year, it's going to be $4. And this is because the king gives you a gift because he's ever a compassion to his children. And, uh, and then they were promised uh, that they could hunt and fish and as usual, as old, as always. And, um, and then, you know, uh, 25 years later, they learned what was written on the paper, which was very different. Mm. And uh, it, it, a few years ago, a student who was um, the Grand Chief tells us that in, on the film, he says that the student was doing research at uh, Queen's University and by chance found, a, he saw the diary of one of the com com commissioner, which was uh, McMartin, who was representing the province of Ontario. And, um, and he was writing his diary a full of everything that was happening every day. And this is where, again, there was another proof. He, he says that uh, the way that it was explained was not at all what was written. We know through our history that there have been many treaties signed, and that kind of story where people signed an agreement that they say all the, the elements weren't included in the written document, mm -hmm. that English wasn't their first lang language, um, what was it about this specific treaty? Why this treaty? Why do you want to focus on this one? Mainly because since uh, 2010, I've been working uh, up north. I did two other films previously to this one. And uh, whenever there was a crisis or if the people were in need and a court case, that grand chief was always there. Um, <clears throat> so I was so impressed by um, his concern for his people. He could hear, to me, I, I, I was just amazed. He was always there to give, to give the support of, to the chief and the, to the people in question. And he was a, also a very kind person, and I really always felt so good when I saw him because I knew uh, how much he cared for the people. And then uh, he told me that there was going to be a conference on Treaty Number 9. And previously to that, I went to interview him after he uh, had the chemo because he had uh, cancer in uh, Kingston. So I asked him, I said, do you think we could come and film the conference? You're gonna? And he said, sure. So I went and I got more and more into it, realizing even much more than I thought how um, unjust this was, you know, to tricking the people into signing something that uh, was not at all what they were told. It's... um. You're very emotional about this. This isn't just a filmmaker making, a, you know, a documentary about something that they feel passionate about. This is very personal for you. I'm, all the films I make, I'm very, um, very involved with the people, especially if it's education and children. Uh, that's really my main in interest. 
since always. But I just find uh, everywhere I go, I find extraordinary people that survive so many things and uh, are decent and kind and and you know they're not always well treated and it's uh, it touches me. Mm. Mm. This treaty, um, <clears throat> it, it was signed 110 years ago. H- how do you, because it's so relevant today, and we'll talk yes. more about that, but h- how, as a filmmaker, do you approach dramatizing, which at the end of the day is a document that was signed so long ago? Well, it affects the people today as if it was yesterday. Hmm. And you know, here now we're talking about land, waters, and the health of the land and the, the trees and you know, all the environment uh, is, uh, is connected. What's going to happen with this Bill C-35 that passed? And uh, it changes uh, certain rights of the people and the land. And it's a very serious thing. You know? Federal government bill, Bill C-35. Yeah. Um, this is... Um, very much in the news lately um, because, as you say, um, Bill C-35 and, and parts of the agreement are subject to court challenges. Of all the things that you have learned in the making of this film, um, what troubles you the most? There's lots. It's <laughs> not just one thing, but, uh, of course, you know, it's the uh, the land issue and uh, the um, natural resources and, uh, you know, when you see the po- poverty that people live in, and, you know, some uh, some nations don't even have running water. And uh, in James Bay, they have uh, running water in most places, but uh, in a lot of cases, the water is not fit to drink. You have to boil it. All those kinds of things, it, uh, it's a very serious offense, I think. And... Um, and then you see like the injustices and the the, the way in uh, you know in the, in 1960 we became citizens of our country and in 1960 for us many things changed that's when we started to organize we started having organization in almost in every province it took a certain time and one representing everybody and um, 61, 62, 63, I often went to the courtroom and uh, I would always sit with a person from the Human Rights Commission and we would watch and there would be lines of mostly men but some women too, Indian people and it was guilty, guilty, guilty. There was no, they had no voice, zero voice. And, I, you know, I used to tell the person from you, and I said, you know what, the silence here to me says to these people who are standing there, you shut up, we know all about you, you're guilty. That's what it meant to me. And it was so hard to watch. It was really, uh, really awful for many, many years. And I want people who are listening now to understand, and I want them to know that there's been a lot of changes I'm now doing a film in the courtroom. Not only that, I see our people being respected. I see that they have a voice. I see that the judge respects these voices and the lawyers, certainly their lawyers. It's a very different time. And I am very encouraged in terms of there will be justice. Mm. There will be justice on all those wrongdoing. And it, it's it's not fair for us to think, oh, the government, you know, they don't care, or it's uh, they cheat you, and uh, they they have the the power to change, and they don't. I believe that it will change. I really believe that uh, this this treaty and others will be rewritten. And what gives you that faith? Because so many in the Aboriginal community and in the non-Aboriginal community say things won't change. We've been stuck in this stasis for so long and that we're not... What gives you the faith? I have it because I've seen some changes and it, you know, it's, it, it doesn't happen overnight, but I've seen changes in the educational system. Think all the residential schools are done now. Thank God for that. 
And uh, even though it is difficult, especially for the communities that are isolated in terms of services in education and health services is uh, not, it's awful. At the same time, if you look at the amount of people we have in high educa higher education now, it's immense. We, now we have judges, we have lawyers, we have doctors, we have social workers, we have photographers, we have filmmakers. None of them had it easy. But look, I, we have to also talk about what we've accomplished. People uh, you know, in the, at the community level who uh, fought back and uh, fought for change and... If you walk on the street, uh, you know, for a long time, maybe, maybe we had people on the street, so people walk and they say, oh, I can't stand these Indians, go across the street. Well, now maybe somebody smiles at those people and makes you feel different. And I really, I know how hard it is. I know how hard I have it to do what I do. But I refuse to think that it's going to stay or that it's going to get worse. It won't. It go, it's going to get better because, first of all, we have all these people who have a lot of education. And even at the community level, you have people in every community that are extraordinary. And I, I just I want to honor mm. these people. In your documentary, there's, um, I think it's Sean Atlio, there's a moment where, I think it's him, where he says, we're at a fork in the road. Yes. Now we have the choice of what way we, we go. Yeah. Especially uh, what he was talking about with the women going on missing and being killed and uh, beaten. And it, it's just horrifying. And almost every week we hear of another one that uh, is disappearing. And that's really terrible. And where does Alanise Obamsawin fit into this as a filmmaker? Is your film a form of activism? Is it a form of healing? Is it a call to action? It's everything of that. It's going for changes. Make sure that the people have their voice at, at the best place and the most dignified way and uh, recognizing them. People are beautiful. You know, I, when I did this film, uh, the people of the Catawapiskat River, some women called me from Ellie, and she said, how could you be making such a beautiful film about such an ugly story? I said, Madame, you know, it's not because you're poor that you're ugly. Of course, we've always been told that we were ugly. But now I realize we're not ugly. And it's not true. that You could be as poor as there's something beautiful about a human being. If you listen and if you watch and if you hear and look at the face of these people, they're beautiful. There's no other way. I cannot describe uh, all those people that have been in these films with me otherwise. There is, um, here we sit in, um, you know, 2014. So much has happened um, over those 110 years since the treaty, since Treaty 9 was signed. And, and, much of the promises, many of the promises, much of the promised land has been developed for other things. There are differing views, if I can mm -hmm. put it so politely, um, over what was agreed to yes. in this treaty and what it really means today. Yeah. What What do you think Canada should be doing um, to bring us together to move forward? I think Canada should sit with the people and really listen to their their lives and what has happened to them because of the way that this treaty, um, we're talking about one treaty in particular, and uh, change it and rewrite the treaty. In fairness, there's no other door to go to. It's that. They have to redo it. And the government is trying to make treaties with different nations that didn't have treaties or the, the ancient treaties. They are, they are rewriting them. And I'm sure it's going to happen. They have their lawyers. They have people that are constantly working and fighting for them. And eventually, it's going to happen because it has to. You can't have a country who's going to lie and uh, cheat people, and then other people come into power, and they're not necessarily uh, um, people who want to continue that. They want to change. There are a lot of good people who go into politics, and want, they go in f to, to help the country or to make a better place for 
all the different whether it's environment or poverty or we hear about it all the time so i know there's going to be enough good people that will have the power and will do it i won't be here because i'm 82 years old <laughs> but it's going to happen mm-hmm. your film um It was featured, as I said in our introduction, in the master's program at, at TIFF this year. That, that's a huge, prestigious place. Oh, it was wonderful. Yeah. I was just so happy, especially for the place that the people get. You know, they're in the film and they're in the top place. And for me, that was such an honor. So for you, it's not about you being placed no, in the master's. It's, it's about the it's people. What you... it, yeah. It's how the people are represented, where they're being seen, and it's a lot of prestige. Mm. And uh, it, it was really such an honor. And, and does it feel like a mm, new level of acceptance for your work to, to be honored in, in such a mainstream, big way? Um, I don't know what to call it, <laughs> but uh, I feel very respected and... Uh, For me, uh, it's the dignity of people that I'm more concerned with. And uh, for them to be represented like that, in, uh, it's, it's so special. Mm. We talked just a little bit ago about um, this moment that we're at in our history where many First Nations artists have, have broken through with their work. Um, I spoke a couple of weeks ago um, to the actress, the director of Strange Empire. It's had a big impact, um, a tribe called Red, become internationally successful. What does it say to you, Alanis, that um, Indigenous artists are breaking through, like, in, in this way in Canada right now? I, is it about something beyond the art? Yeah, I think it's more profound, but uh, I, I think also for the longest time, the educational system and their books that they were using to tell the history of Canada was really designed to create hate toward our people. That I'm telling you. And uh, so for the longest time, uh, it was all right to uh, have very bad thoughts about uh, Indigenous people. They were inferior, they were ugly, they were... Uh, all the things that is embarrassing uh, as a human being, this is what uh, the way they looked at us. Mm-hmm. And I think the uh, educational part of who we are, are <clears throat> and who we were really f- falls on, on us, on our backs, to educate. And it's very important. So all these years since 1960, it's incredible what this country, the Canadians, have learned about us. Through us. It's interesting that you say the Canadians, yeah. like the other. Yeah. We're Canadian. We never were Canadian until 1960. Mm. So, yeah, I'm an Abenaki woman. That's what I am. Your film focuses a lot on what's happened <coughs> over the last couple of, couple of years. Teresa, Chief Spence's, Teresa mm-hmm. Spence's um, hunger strike on Parliament Hill, what was going on at Adawapiskat, um, protest movements like Idle No More, got a lot of attention a couple of years ago when that was um, all taking place, I guess, in a, in a more intense moment. It does feel to some extent that it's it, that moment, that movement ha- has fizzled out Um, or at least that there there is debate about the effectiveness of it all as a movement, even within the Aboriginal community. Why do you think that is? Where are we now? I think where we are is incredible. And where we're going is 10 times more incredible. Mm-hmm. Because as you can see the marchers in the... Uh, In, in the stuff about I don't know more in the film. And then the Nishu young people walking from... Uh, Wap Magusti, which is like Great Will, Quebec, to Ottawa at that age of mm. 17. And I don't know how old the others were with a guide. It's the way they talk. You know, since the 60s, we, we would say, this is the seventh generation. We've been saying this. Ever since, because all of a sudden, so many of us got up and they call us activists and we did many things. But now I say this is the one that's the seventh generation. And, you know, there were prophecies that the seventh generation would be the one that would save our people. And uh, to hear the young people 
now. You know, I'm sure, as you know, we've had many suicides and many very serious problems, and we still do have, but it's changing. And it's changing because it comes from the young people themselves. Mm-hmm. And uh, when you hear um, this young man who, uh, who uh, decided to do the walk, he told me, as he was walking, and of course when they started, it was 56 below zero, um, at, at one of the, they would stop in some communities on the way to here, to Ottawa, and uh, he, he turned his foot, he had like, I guess, a sprained ankle, and he said it was very painful. And so the guide had a skido, and he said, he kept saying, don't walk anymore, you're going to make it worse. Come and sit on the ski do. He says, I refuse. I told myself, my ancestors did not have ski do's. And they walked. And he says, I took my snowshoes off and I used them as crutches. Mm-hmm. You know? And he says, I kept thinking, my, my grandparents, my great grandparents, all those ancestors, the life that they had, they walked the land like that over the frozen rivers and frozen lake, and uh, the will for him to not take, uh, to be spoiled in in any way, to just, I I just think it's just so great. We talk um, a lot about this these days, this idea of reconciliation, um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, and our, our, our collective reconciliation with Canada's Indigenous people. What does true reconciliation look like for you? It's an incredible movement that has uh, already made quite a mark. Because until then, many people hid the fact that they were in residential school and had been maltreated or were raped or all those things. It was always silent. And I understand it. You don't go around and say, hey, isn't that great? I was raped at 10 times or I was beaten. You, know, you just didn't uh, want to say it because it's so humiliating, first of all, to go through that. And then you think you're going to go and tell that just to the world. It's a very uh, terrible thing. And, and the reconciliation has, has, is acting as a... It's, it's even more than a healing space, making a, a place for people to come and finally admit or tell th- these horrifying stories. And it's making a difference because when you're keeping something for so many generations, it's a secret and you don't tell or you never even tell your children what happened to you in, uh, in those places. Um, it's a help for each individual to be able to tell the story, not feeling that somebody is going to judge them or, or treat them worse than, than before. That in itself alone is a big help to those who have gone through that kind of uh, life and sometimes repeating it with their own children. It's very, very difficult for anybody to... And to those who say, it's a part of our history, and yes, it might be an ugly part of our history, but it is time to turn the page and move forward. Yes. And not only that, but it's also time that Canadians should know that. Other people that are here should know what the true history is here. And that makes a big difference. I think they start looking at the the people differently. You know, realizing that organized government places were there to really uh, destroy the life of our people and torturing them on the way, too. So, uh, so many stories that every time I say, oh, my God, I thought I heard it all. And there's always something worse all the time. It's just... uh, but I believe also that people that uh, have gone through all this, and if if they can allow themselves to come back to 
to go on a different road are the strongest. It's something difficult to say, but um, when you spend so many generations being told who you are, you're not even allowed to say who you are. They tell you who you are. They told us your language is the devil's language. To the point that in school, if you spoke your language, the nuns and the priests, they, they, you know, they would punish you and tell you that this is a dirty language and you can't speak it. Can you just imagine, like little children who could only speak their children, who could only speak their language, were treated like that. And what does that do to, you have to be ashamed of your language? You have to be ashamed of who you are? You're not allowed to be. So you become invisible and you, you're undertaking all, uh, all this stuff and you're supposed to be silent. So it was a big secret. And um, it's been like that. What is difficult to understand when sometimes, uh, let's say a priest or a brother or a, uh, I'm thinking of a doctor right now um, who really maltreated the people and then it was found out and uh, then it, this person would disappear. But what did they do? They just transferred them to another reserve. This is what I, you know, when I read and when I hear these things, I just find it, it's almost mm. difficult to believe. Mm. Huh? And yet we move forward. Yes. And uh, my, my biggest encouragement is to watch the young people talking. They're going around like missionaries now. They go to a lot of universities and a lot of gathering, and they're talking. And many of them had drug problems and, or other kinds of problems. And they say, no, I, that's not for us. We are great people, and our ancestors were great. And look at how they survived all this hardship. And uh, so it's a different time. The language is just so there. It's so amazing. Even that young girl, she's 16 years old. When I asked her, how old are you? She said, I'm, I'm so happy I did this walk, and I'm, it's better for me now. My life is, is better, and I'm going to tell my children and my grandchildren. She goes on and on. And I said, how old are you? She said, 16. She talks like an old lady, <laughs> you know. It's... Uh, a, a responsibility, a duty that I find that the young people are taking and uh, they're so responsible and bringing other ones that are in trouble and encouraging them. It's incredible. I think it's so rich. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just so amazed with those voices. I can't tell you what a pleasure it's been talking to you. Sincerely, thank you very much, and thank you for having hope and pushing forward. Thank you. <laughs>